Hi, this is Dr. Sami Ghazal. Today I'm going to talk to you about the Valsalva maneuver usage in echocardiography. So everything I'm going to talk to you about today is taken from my paper Valsalva maneuver in echocardiography. Uh, this paper was recently published in Journal of Echocardiography. It's the Journal of the Japanese Society of Echocardiography. So for more details and references, you can refer back to the paper. So Valsalva maneuver is extremely useful in echocardiography. However, it should be done correctly and adequately. And believe it or not, oftentimes it's done inadequately or incorrectly and interpreted uh, in incorrect way. So the, the main purpose of this talk is to emphasize the importance of correct and adequate Valsalva maneuver. Antonio Maria Valsalva, he's the scientist um, who described the Valsalva maneuver, as the name implies, over 300 years ago. Um, he's an Italian anatomist, and the, in, the initial purpose of Valsalva was to test the patency of a staking tube. Later on in 1850, uh, the cardiovascular effects of Valsalva uh, were demonstrated in a um, um, scientific meeting by Ernest uh, Weber, who uh, performed Valsalva on himself, and he demonstrated bradycardia. So in simple wordings, Valsalva is nothing but forceful expiration against closed nose and mouth. So in order to understand uh, the usage of Valsalva maneuver in echocardiography, uh, someone has to understand very well um, the physiology of Valsalva maneuver and its effect on the cardiovascular system. Not only that, the effect on the right side of the heart and the effect on the left side of the heart. The effect of of the left side of the heart can be divided into four phases. Simply, we start by phase one, which is the beginning of the strain. And because now we have increase in the intrathoracic pressure, we have positive intrathoracic pressure. So there is a squeeze on the uh, left atrium. So this squeeze of the left atrium will expel the blood to the LV and then to the aorta. And then we have increase in aortic pressure. And then what's gonna happen to the heart rate Due to the presence of baroreceptor and reflex uh, mechanism uh, in the carotid, we're going to have a decrease in the heart rate. And then what's going to happen on the right side? Because the IVC and SVC, mainly they lie outside of the thoracic cavity. So the increase of the pressure against the RA will have a less blood coming from the IVC and SVC. So there is a less gradient or pressure gradient between RA and SVC and IVC. And then what's going to happen here, uh, less volume, of course, going to the right side. By the time the patient continue to strain, this decrease of the preload will reflect to the left side with a consequent beats. And then we're going to have a decrease of the aortic pressure and increase of the heart rate due to um, reflex mechanism. And then we're going to reach some sort of plateauing here. And then we're going to have phase three, which is demarcated by the abrupt stopping uh, of the strain. So what's going to happen here, the, the LA will start to fill. There is now no much pressure against the LA from outside. So it's going to start to fill and send less blood to the LV and less blood then to the aorta. Then we have a little bit decrease of the aortic pressure. And again, as a reflex, we have increase in the heart rate. And then we're gonna have some sort of um, uh, going back to the baseline. However, in phase three, what's gonna happen to the right side? The right side and because of IVC and SVC now are congested with blood. Once strain stops, then we're going to have a gush of blood from the IVC and SVC to the RA. Even the RA pressure now will exceed the LA pressure. And this is the exact point we will, where we look for intraatrial shunting. So having said that, uh, the indication of Valsalva maneuver and echocardiography can um, be either the one utilizing phase three or the one utilizing phase two. 
we're going to start by phase three here because it's only one which is uh, you want to rule out right to left uh, interarterial shunt as in case in uh, ruling out um, cardiac source of embolism or if you have unexplained right-sided dilatation where the main reason for that may be uh, left to right shunt however a right to left shunt can be demonstrated with a good Valsalva maneuver so the one utilizing phase three is where you need an increase of RA pressure increase of, of the gush of flow uh, to the RA compared to the left atrium and then you have the one utilizing phase two where you want a decrease in the LV volume um, and those can be either if you want to provocate uh, dynamic LVOT obstruction as for example case of hokum you have a hokum um, without a significant uh, LVOT gradient uh, less than 30 uh, and maybe the patient is still symptomatic and you want to just prove that there is um, an increase in the LVOT grad uh, gradient um, with maybe exercise or with Valsalva having said that exercise still more physiologic for that particular uh, indication the other ones um, when you have um, um, aortic valve replacement and LVH once you relieve this obstruction of aortic valve then you're gonna have hyperdynamic uh, LV causing um, uh, LVOT obstruction uh, third indication in that category would be uh, post myocardial infarction if you have a mid wall to apical myocardial infarction then you're gonna have a compensatory uh, hyperdynamic basal segment where it can cause sometimes um, LVOT obstruction Valsalva can be very helpful here the third indication against utilizing phase 2 which is you just want to decrease uh, the LV filling is for estimation of LV filling pressure if you want to grade uh, diastolic function and you are in, in the borderline zone so um, Valsalva can be very helpful here um, uh, and we're going to see an example of that if you have evidence of impaired LV relaxation i.e. tissue Doppler the A velocity is abnormal however the filling pressure is not uh, not very quite um, um, indicative of um, uh, impaired filling pressure or increased filling pressure we're going to have some example of those in the coming slides adequacy of the Valsalva maneuver has to be checked we cannot comment on Valsalva maneuver without making sure it was performed adequately so the sonographer should be trained how to check for adequate Valsalva maneuver we have clinical signs for that uh, in form of distension of the neck veins and flushing of the face and increase of the abdominal muscle tone we also have echocardiographic criteria for adequate Valsalva maneuver and again we can divide it into those adequate check in phase two where you need a decrease in the LV volume or LV filling volume and those can be checked easily by checking uh, the decrease of E velocity during Valsalva so adequate Valsalva maneuver or adequate phase two of Valsalva is defined as a decrease of the E velocity by 20 or more so here we have an for example it's around um, 100 cm and it was decreased to around uh, 50 cm so you need a decrease from the E um, before the Valsalva to the E after Valsalva of 20 cm per second or more if the Valsalva maneuver is being performed mainly to check intraatrial uh, shunting i.e. phase 3 is the one important here so again phase 3 adequacy can be easily checked by demonstrating an adequate leftward um, shift of the intraatrial septum as we have here in this transesophageal example this is um, the intraatrial septum uh, and during the release phase or phase 3 of Valsalva we can see a leftward shift um, and then you can see the bubble passing through the PFO from the RA to the LA now let's see some examples of uh, Valsalva maneuver usage in echocardiography this is exact same previous uh, example where it was performed mainly to demonstrate uh, intraatrial shunting 
And one of the tricks we have to do is to keep the patient's training until we see the RA is fully filled with the bubbles. And this, at this particular point, you ask the patient to release from the valsalva. Then you check for adequacy by demonstrating a leftward shift of the septum, and then you have to demonstrate the passage of the bubble through the PFO. It's not enough to see bubble in the left atrium only. You have to see it passing through the PFO to call it a PFO. And it is worth mentioning that if you can demonstrate um, adequate Valsalva, the false negatives here is much lower than uh, if Valsalva maneuver was not demonstrated to be uh, adequate. A common problem is usually uh, being faced when trying to increase uh, the RA pressure, especially in sedated patient with the patient cannot obey your command or your instruction. So in that case, there is some alternative maneuver. It's not for Valsalva, it's uh, for increasing of RA pressure. And it's worth mentioning here that we can use some of those maneuvers. Uh, one of them is, is uh, cuffing, either spontaneous, we ask the patient to cuff, or if he's really sedated, we can um, induce cuffing by suctioning. Arm raising after the contrast injection, uh, the same arm where uh, contrast uh, was injected and then leg raising another uh, maneuver and then uh, abdominal compression. These maneuvers can be used however they are uh, less effective than adequate Valsalva. Another example here is where Valsalva maneuver is being performed mainly for diastolic function assessment and the LV filling. Um, um, the, the phase here is needed is phase two where you want to decrease the LV filling volume um, and decreasing preload. So in that case, you need to, um, to keep recording 10 seconds into strain. It's not enough just to ask the patient to strain for one or two or three seconds. You need to, to keep recording 10 seconds into the strain. And also you need to, um, to show adequacy of the Valsalva maneuver, as we mentioned earlier, by demonstrating um, a decrease uh, in the E velocity by 20 cm per second. Uh, one, one important thing to mention here is um, um, the correct sample volume should be maintained just above the mitral valve or at the mitral tips at all times. It has been shown that the decrease in the E2A ratio more than 50% or equal to 50% and more is indicative of high um, LV filling pressure and diastolic dysfunction, provided there is no fusion between the EA um, uh, when there is increase in the heart rate. And as in this example, we can see the E to A ratio uh, of 1.6, which decreased during Valsalva to 0 0.6, which is definitely um, more than 50%. And hence, uh, this patient is having a high LV filling pressure. One of the very important utility of Valsalva maneuver in echocardiography um, is in uh, dynamic LVOT obstruction. This is, uh, will utilize phase two Valsalva where there is a decrease in the LV filling. And then um, uh, we can check for um, uh, increase of the obstruction as in case of HOCAM where the patient is symptomatic, uh, but there is no enough uh, gradient to explain that symptoms or post AVR, aortic valve replacement with LVH or post uh, myocardial infarction in the mid to distal cavity and hyperdynamic uh, basal segments. So once you see this dagger shaped late peaking flow uh, across the LVOT, but you don't have enough gradient, you may think of um, uh, performing Valsalva maneuver and to check whether that gradient will go high, um, maybe 40 or 50. This is um, an example of dynamic LVOT obstruction with Valsalva, where we can see the resting gradient across the LVOT measured to be 32. Uh, with Valsalva, adequate Valsalva, we reach up to 74 millimeter mercury during strain. In conclusion, Valsalva easily performed maneuver. Uh, it should be performed in every echocardiography lab. Um, it can be utilized to uh, diagnose LVOT obstruction, uh, diastolic dysfunction, and intraatrial shunting. However, there is a big emphasis on the correct and adequate performance of uh, Valsalva maneuver. 
non-adequate Valsalva maneuver should be discarded and never reported. Thank you very much for your listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation.